welcome everybody this afternoon to a whole uh, afternoon of the Penn Literary Salon, beginning with the wonderful mm -hmm. Deborah Mogak, who is going to be talking about her new book, Something to Hide, which I said, not quite correctly, is your 20th book, but actually it turns out I'd missed one out, am I right? I think it's 20. I don't think you've left. I think she's done her homework. She always does, Alex. I think it is the 20th. It is. Yes, I think she's right. So what was the book that I, that I, I had poultry tell me? My first book, and nobody in the world knows this, and I'm sure you'll be fascinated, is Poultry Keeping in the Tropics. And I, and I wrote it when I was living in Pakistan um, for OUP, which my then husband was working for. And I'd forgotten about this book entirely until two days ago when I was clearing out some stuff and found it. It's a lovely little pamphlet. I know it's a proper book, but anyway. There was nothing you didn't know about poultry keeping in the tropics. There's nothing I don't know about poultry keeping. If any of the questions are about it, I'd be pleased to answer them. We will be coming to questions a little bit later. We're going to chat for sort of 15, 20 minutes. We'll come to you for questions. And then, Deborah, you're going to be signing at the, um, at the foil stand just over there. Um, and we're going to kind of range widely over your work, but let's start with this book. Something to Hide is your new book. It's published this, this summer. Um, just tell us a little bit about it. I know it's, it's, it's an internationally flavoured book, isn't it? It's very odd, because I haven't yet spoken about this book. I haven't worked out, well, A, what it's about, because one never really knows what they're about, or B, how to sort of talk it up. The title, Something to Hide, you could actually apply to any novel or any film mm. ever done, because mm. we all have something to hide. And the woman who leads us into the story is a sort of 60-year-old woman, my sort of age, who's had a bit, of a, a bit of a rocky past in the old love department. And um, she ends up in Africa because she falls mad in love with her best friend's husband. And then something terrible happens and she goes to Africa. But the, the sort of meat of the book is really sort of global things. It's got elephant poaching, it's got farmer piracy, it's got the fact that the Chinese now are um, taking to surrogate motherhoods in America because the, the fertility has gone down in China. And if you have a baby born in America, it becomes an Amer American citizen. Actually, the book sounds quite dull now I'm saying it like that. It's not. I'm trying to work out how to make it sound more interesting. It's full of terrible, terrible tragedies and laughter and, and undignified sex in middle age. <laughs> My favourite subject. I speak from a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, it did start, though, didn't it, um, with your sort of um, love of verging on obsession with keeping, keeping abreast of the news. So you are always scouring newspapers for interesting, quirky stories. And that's sort of how the book, the germ of the book started, I well, think. Well, it's because it? I'm, I'm a novelist, so I've spent the whole time reading the papers, anything to stop work. So I read the Times, I read the Guardian, I read the Independent, I read them all. With any luck, I don't start work till about half past 11. So I'm quite well informed, don't get so much done. And then it's done. nearly lunchtime. And then it's nearly lunchtime, and I can't work in the afternoon. <laughs> so that's quite, that <laughs> solves that day. Um, but it's actually one of the, one of the spurs of this book, which, I, which was extraordinary, was Plan International, um, sent me to Ghana to, for a week, going around villages, looking, talking to women, which was a, I had to write a short story about it. And there I discovered that because everyone in Africa, because this novel is mostly set in Africa, fictitious African country, um, because everyone in Africa has mobile phones and you have these Maasai warriors listening to the football results in the middle of the you know, plains, um, but there's no electricity in most of the villages, what they do, what I discovered when I was going around with this, with this charity, is that in the local towns, when people come to market every week with, with their product, pr produce, there's a phone charging booth. And they leave their phones with them, and it charges up while they, they sell their wares. And I thought, that's, that's quite interesting, because the guy who runs the booth as the, the power comes back into the phones, they all start bleeping, and he can listen to messages, and he can read texts, and he can know what everybody's up to, and what a position of power he's in. So that, that was one of the spurs of the story, and then there were these other big themes, and, but it was this woman, Petra, the woman of my sort of age, who lives in London, who le leads us into this 
world in Africa. So we're sort of with her all the way, and something really ghastly happens to her. Well, two or three really ghastly things happen to her. I'm a bit of a sadist, really. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you split the narrative, don't you, between her and, and the other women who kind of share the story, as it were. So you have mm. a kind of a Texan housewife who's got, again, something to hide because she has somehow lost the sort of family fortune and has to make it back. You have somebody in China who is in a kind of very difficult situation herself. You've got all these different women's stories. Yeah. And I think that is quite a kind of new way for you to write, isn't it, with these sort of multiple Narratives. Yes, I mean, I'm a great, great fan of <coughs> particularly Robert Altman's films where you see somebody walking along here and you follow their story and then we go over there and we see how lives interact and at the bus stop you carry on with somebody else. And I'm just constantly fascinated by the way our lives are intertwined. And films like Babel, I mean, there, there are some films that approach this which I think are very ambitious and interesting because the coincidences and the links that we have, particularly more so now because it, the world is so globalized and you know i mean i remember realizing how the world's changing when i was buying some fish from the fishmonger where i live and he was talking about going to singapore for the weekend just as if one goes to singapore for the weekend and i thought isn't that extraordinary how how global our lives are completely now and so the, the way lives interact is is uh, fascinates me because they do and the texan woman that alex was saying she um she's a victim of an online scam which means that she loses all the money of the family and her husband's away in iraq fighting and she's got to do something to get forty eight thousand dollars back and um she she thinks she has a very, very interesting way of doing it, but that then links up with what's happening in Africa. So it all... I had very good fun writing it because of the interconnectedness. That's partly uh, sort of overlaps with another thing that I've noticed you doing pe perhaps more and more, which is having your characters sort of in flight. I mean, in your last book, Heartbreak Hotel, there was something of that, you know, somebody basically saying, okay, I've got to turn my back on London where I've lived for many years. And they fly to something, they know not what it is. In that case, it was a sort of rather run-down guest <laughs> house on the kind of Welsh border, wasn't it? To sort of obviously kind of comic effect. Yes, a uh, house which I've actually bought now and live in. <laughs> Do you think that's taking How research that a bit is. far? It is taking research very far. It's most extraordinary. Um, so I'm living in my own novel and meeting people in this small town, Prestine in Powys, who I've put in the novel. I mean... Um, How do they feel about that when you come well, across them in the fishmongers? How's funnily that? enough, people don't mind being in books, even if it's not very flattering. And I'd love to be in somebody's novel. I'd feel very permanent and like a real person, weirdly enough, if I was in print. Um, so they don't usually mind, or they don't recognize themselves. Um, but no, I think the thing about breaking out and starting a new life, it gets more and more interesting the older you are, because you realize that the possibilities are endless. They don't close off. In a weird way, they open out. And I think the success of the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, which I wrote as a novel called These Foolish Things, is that people in their 70s and 80s, if they're up for it, can have another life, they can cross the world, start another life, in this case in India, if, if, they, if they feel like it, because we live so much longer. And I see couples striding around hand in hand in their 70s and 80s, and they've you know, been on their fourth winter break of the year, and they've had their cruise, and they've all got a deep tan, um, and they're eating into their children's inheritance by ha having a very good time. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like putting snipers on National Trust properties to just cull us all and let the kids <laughs> have a chance. Because we're, we're, we're living so long and we're having this sort of new life, you know, after pensionable age, which I'm, you know, having enormous fun writing about and doing. But the poor kids, we're going to have nothing left to give them. We're sort of ruining their lives. We're now. ruining their lives. We're sitting on our nice properties and we're eating into, the, into their inheritance. Well, you know, I guess they just have to deal with that. I yeah, mean, you get know. over it. Yeah. Um, just tell me a little bit about Best Exotic Marigold Hotel and seeing it on screen and now seeing it on screen again with added Richard Gear. Isn't it weird? So <laughs> weird. Um, it was very, an extraordinary sensation because I, I wrote this novel about outsourcing the elderly and <laughs> to India, um, which wasn't quite as daft as it sounds because I thought, look, it's cheap, 
it's warm, huge respect for the elderly in, in India, and they call you, un, you know, uncle and auntie. School kids, invariably polite and obedient, you know, noticeable absence of hoodies, um, a residual respect for the Raj, English spoken hugely. Grandchildren will go and visit you in a, in a boarding house in Rajasthan, a sight quicker than in a horrible retirement home in a muddy field outside Woking. Um, and have a holiday in Goa thrown in. And it's jolly cheap going to India. Ridiculously, scandalously cheap. So I had this idea, which is a sort of general idea. Mostly my novels have sprung from overhearing something or seeing something or buying a painting in the case of Tulip Fever, which was a novel I wrote about Vermeer's Amsterdam. This one was a, a big idea about what's going to happen to us. And I did think we outsource everything else why not outsource the elderly? Why not India? And everyone giggled when I told them, but they've stopped now because actually it's caught on. And I think what happened was it was picked up and made into this film with a cast of thesps to die for. Mm. I mean, uh, thoroughbred, you know, Maggie Smith, Judy Dench, Tom Wilkinson, I mean, Bill Nye, Bill Nye. When you say <laughs> the name Bill Nye, it's like, Wind through corn. It's <laughs> it's women's women's exhaled breath. Bill Nye, um, who's t far too young for the film. Actually, he's my he's less than my sixty two, I think, or something when the film was made. But, but sportingly, he aged, <laughs> he aged up. And same with Celia Imry. Um, and you know, once you pull in one A list actor, basically at that stage in their careers, they just want to have a hoot with their mates. And what could be more Hootish than going to India in hideous, horrible November, living in a gorgeous hotel, acting your socks off with your old mates. They've all been married to each other a million times on stage and screen and divorced, sometimes real life as well. They, they, they had the best fun. I think that's why they went back and did a sequel, which I had nothing to do with, which was very odd because in the first film, although it's very different to my book, the book has more complicated plots, it's slightly darker, all sorts of things. But the second one, they are these residual characters who I vaguely recognize, but they're having a whole new life that I've had nothing to do with. So it's, it's quite, it's, it is very, very odd. Um, but because the film's been this huge success, and I think another reason is that it's a film about people who, I won't call old, I'll call very grown up indeed. These people are very grown up indeed. It's not entirely about incipient death, dementia, strokes. I mean, the Michael Haneke film was on at the same time, Amor. And if any of you have seen that and haven't slit your throats with depression, um, you know, old age, the wings of mortality are brushing its cheek. You know, it doesn't deny that old age is not for sissies, but it's saying that we're just the same people. Not only need we can have another episode to our lives, chapter in our lives, but the we're the same people we always are, which of course is the experience of getting older. We are the same people. Yes. We fall in love. I mean, I got married again last year, you know, hence moving to this house. Falling in love, we're jealous, we have joys, we're exactly the same. And that hasn't been reflected in our culture. It's, it's, it, it hasn't been really at all. And I think that the, the film of The Best Exotic and, and to some extent the book have set another agenda. And I'm terribly pleased about that. It's given pleasure. Tell us a little bit while we are talking about films, about the forthcoming film of Tulip Fever, which has been hugely long time in the making, hasn't it? That's been a real, a real saga. It's been the most... How long have you got? <laughs> They're all here. They've got no, nowhere else to go. There's nothing happening. Just a huge book fair. Um, Tulip Fever was a novel I wrote 20 years ago that was inspired by a painting, um, uh, a painting that I bought at auction, a sort of sub-Vermeer painting of a woman getting ready to go out. Um, and I thought, she's sitting with that little lovely fur trim jacket that they all wore in Vermeer's time. And I thought, I hung her in my sitting room, and I thought, she's, she's going somewhere she shouldn't. And I wanted to walk into that painting the way that you feel you can walk into those Dutch paintings of that era with those lovely sort of stilled moments of domestic drama with a lovely patterned floor and a woman playing the virginal and a maid sweeping and a man bringing a glass of wine. And they're like film stills. And so it inspired a story which I wrote 
and illustrated. Random House were very sporting about this because I put Dutch paintings in the manuscript and I said, do you mind if we put these paintings in the book? And they said, go for it, which was, which was great because it meant that you read the novel and throughout the novel you saw famous Dutch paintings that sort of bounced off mm. the story mm. and gave an echo to the story and it was lovely looking at them. And the, the day I'd finished the manuscript before it had even been published, the, um, uh, somebody who'd optioned it got a call from Steven Spielberg from his car in LA saying he wants to make it into a movie. <gasps> so the kind of thing you want to hear if you're a novelist. She thought it was a joke. She thought it was a mate of hers phoning up. It wasn't. And so the next week, she and I flew off to LA. And I had, do you know my Milkman story? Well, shall I tell you my Milkman yes. story? Okay. My Milkman at the time was called Ron. And Ron was a great film buff. And he and I used to talk about movies. I'm walking down the path with my suitcase. <clears throat> and Ron's delivering the milk. And he said, where are you going, Deb? And I said, funny you should say that. I'm off to Hollywood to have a meeting with Steven Spielberg. Um, <laughs> he's very impressed. And I said, I'm, I'm doing this film, and you and me can be extras in it, because I'm always an extra in my own films. Um, we, we, we can be uh, market traders. Jump in the cab, go off to Hollywood. On the flight, Barry Norman was sitting across the aisle. This is virgin upper class. Never been on it before. Face massages, heaven. And... I said to Barry, he said, well, Debbie, you know, what are you doing? And I said, funny enough, funny you should ask, Barry. I'm flying to L.A. to have a meeting with Steven Spielberg, actually. <laughs> um, and I've just written this novel, Tulip Fever, and I've got one advanced copy which I'm going to give to Steven Spielberg to suck up to him. And Barry Norman was obviously dying to read his Guardian and have a snooze, but I said, will you read it? Have a look at it. So poor old Barry, a gent to the last, took the book, and I saw him manfully trying to read it when he was dying to sleep. And at the end of the flight, as we landed in L.A., he said, he gave me back the book and he whispered, I've written on one of the pages, Steven Spielberg is a wanker. <laughs> so I thought, thank you, Barry. Um, desperately thumbing through it. Go to the meeting, come back. The next day, I look at the local paper and there's a huge photograph of my milkman saying, milkman to star in Steven Spielberg <laughs> movie. So I thought, oh, blimey. And... The phone rang as I was looking at this, and they said, it's the Daily Express here. We've been speaking to Mr. Penrose. He's given us an interview. And I said, who's Mr. Penrose? And they said, Mr. Ronald Pen." And I said, oh, God, my milkman. And um, they said, can you... He, he suggested we interviewed you as well. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> um, so the, the Express said, well, you know, tell us about your fourth, his forthcoming role. And I said, well, there isn't entirely a film yet, there isn't even a script. Indeed, there wouldn't be a script for 15 years. Um, <laughs> but they were obviously desperate to cobble together an interview, so they said, what sort of milkman is Mr. Penrose? Yeah. Um, and I didn't like to tell them, he's the world's worst milkman, because he gambles, so he goes to the gaming clubs at night, doesn't get up till half past two in the afternoon, so by the time he gets around to delivering the milk, it's turned into clotted cream or cheese in the summer. But I didn't want to diss my milkman to, of all papers, the Daily Express. So um, I said, anyway, the film, people wrote it, other people wrote it, Tom Stoppard wrote it, I wrote it, Christopher Hampton wrote it, Lee Hall wrote it, many, many, many drafts. Finally, it's going to be the biggest British movie of the year. This is 15 years ago. And they'd sunk the tanks to make the, the, the canals, the costumes. They got Keira Knightley, Jude Law, Jim Broadbent, going to be a vast film. The week before it was about to shoot, our then Chancellor Gordon Brown closed a tax loophole which destroyed many British films, including ours. So overnight the film was destroyed. All those people lost their jobs. It was ghastly. And the next day, this is a long answer, but I'm, I'm finishing a minute. The next day, we got a call from a, from a garden nursery in Thames Ditton who were who were raising for us, or looking after for us, 12,000 tulips. Because the film is about tulip fever. And the tulips each had its own little pot, 12,000, and they were about this high and in bud, because like little darling actors, they were just about to flower for their scene in two weeks. So there were 12,000. So the, I said to the nursery, why don't you bring 500 round to my front garden and put them in there and the neighbors can have them, including our friend Tracy Chevalier, who's 
film Girl with a Pearl Earring was also having problems then, though it was in the end made. She and I had a bet, thinking of the Ivy here, that whoever's film would be made first would buy the other one lunch at the Ivy. So Tracy bought me lunch at the Ivy because her film was made. Um, she took some of them. So every year after this disastrous demolition of the film, every year in all these gardens in North London where I then lived, these little, little films came up in the tulip beds. <laughs> So it had a rather charming... Anyway, it's now Harvey Weinstein it's bought it. It's finally got there. It's finally yeah. been made with Judy Dench again, Christoph Waltz, Alicia Vikander, Cara Demnier, however you pronounce her name. It's got a huge cast and it's awfully good. I'm in it. But I'm, I'm woman in tavern, smoking a pipe and drinking a pint of beer. My favourite part. But Debbie, we have to ask. I mean, we really need to know, is your milkman in it? No, because he <gasps> retired. He retired. I met him in the street about a couple of months ago and I told him about it. It was too late. He's gone. Do you know we're being, we're being waved at for time now? Oh, we, God! We talked about your Milford. However, I am going to ask you, before I open up to questions, which I will do in a minute, um, a question I really do want to mm. ask you. Your novels, short stories, books, have, they've ranged so widely in terms of, well, you've just been talking about... India, about Amsterdam, about the number of settings in your new novel, and also in terms of, of genre, cut off. I shall shout if you need me to shout. Uh. How are we doing? Yes. Oh. But <laughs> as you were. Wake up at the back. Um, and also in terms of, of, of sort of tone and of style. They're funny, they're sad, they're about issues, they're about personal relationships. Your imagination seems absolutely irrepressible to me, as does your sort of refusable refusal to be penned into one kind of book. Is that how it sort of feels to you? Or does it... What does it feel like? It does yeah. feel like that. And some of the books, like Tulip Fever and um, one or two others, I can't think how I wrote them because they're so different... But that's, I mean, that's a lovely thing about being a writer. If, if you've got a nice, amenable publisher, which I have, they're here, I can see them, um, then they give you the freedom to do that. And they don't say, we want another one. I mean, some of mine, like Heartbreak Hotel, um, are, are kind of light. They're kind of a jeu d'esprit. They're, they're funny. And, 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 they're, and other ones, like Porky and things, are very dark. Mm. And... I mean, I don't, I'm not that fecund. I have about one good idea every two years, but that keeps me going, that one good idea, because I turn that into a book. I don't have millions and millions of plots swilling around at all. And also, I'm spending quite a lot of time adapting them for television and things. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but I'm sort of adapting them all the time. Um, so it's just, I mean, Hilary Mantel is another example. I mean, until she recently, you know, became this huge star of the historical novels, each of her novels were completely unpredictable. Mm. And, um, and why not? If, we ha if we're lucky enough to have the freedom to do that, then you, some subjects need different... You know, I've written, I wrote about incest back in the early 80s when people were never talking about it. A very bleak novel called Porky, set um, in outside Heathrow Airport. I mean, quite a different sort of book, but that's what the subject um, told me the, the mm. novel should be like, rather than, I mean, I wasn't going to write a fluffy, you know, a very jolly book about incest. Let's have some questions from the audience. We have a microphone, and there's a question actually right down here. Sorry to bring you all the way. Um, it's on its way to you. Um, and we will get round as many of you as possible. Um, you've spoken about your ideas for some of your work, but how do your ideas turn into stories? How do you know that you've got something to work with and work into? Good question. How do you know it's not just a sort of passing... Well, that's fancy. the interesting thing. I mean, that sort of gets to the heart of it. What you sift out are the ones that don't have don't have staying power in some way. And, and if they don't stick in your mind, then you just get rid of them. I mean, the, the thing about the mobile phones I was telling you, that's an idea that you can imagine spinning off from, because what you're always saying is, what if, what if? You see the guy with the mobile phones, you think, what if he had a grudge against somebody and he wanted to blackmail them? Then you're off. And once the characters have thickened up and become real people, you know what they'd be like if they were here, 
then you're ready to go and they will help you with the plot because they will take on the idea. But you just know, it's something that you learn. You, you start <coughs> sorry, under, to know what is a, is a long burning uh, idea and what you're just going to shed. And you know, the example I, give, I gave you is, is an idea that, that sort of had echoes. It, it, it should be, perhaps a better answer is that it should be an idea that's bigger than itself. Charging mobile phones, a little technical thing, but bigger than itself is that. And, and for instance, I, I did a novel called Final Demand about check fraud, about a woman who embezzled money by changing um, the check, check thing. You can't write that now, nobody writes checks. Um, a tiny little thing, but that had a funny little reverberation in my head. And I knew that that might actually lead to some big event happening. Um, you just sort of know after a bit. Thank you. Who would like to ask another question? <coughs> yes, there's two, in fact two questions on this bench. We'll start at the end here. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you plot and do you do plot outlines before you write or do they sort of develop as you write? Well, I mean that's interesting as well. They're very good questions. They're getting sort of heart of it. Some books I've sort of laid out the plot quite quite a lot. For instance, Best Exotics, it's a big ensemble piece. It's got a whole lot of characters and there's something to hide. And other ones sort of write themselves. But I do know how they end. And I know quite a lot of what's going to happen on the way with all of them. Because to sound rather gnomic, you know, in the end is the beginning or in the beginning is the end. If something's going to happen to someone, it will inform the very opening of the book somehow. It won't be said. But if she's going to murder somebody or if she's going to slit somebody's throat or realize she's a lesbian or go to Greenland, that somehow is going to be within the book at the very beginning. Um, because novels are all about what you leave out. And because otherwise, anything could happen. It's chaos. So if you know what's going to happen, you're shedding. You're shedding the things that are not so relevant. And that helps you not panic in com the complete chaos of anything possibly happening. Not all writers are like that. Um, even great plotters like Ruth Rendell says that she sends this little boat out in the dark into the, across the sea, hasn't a clue what's going to happen. I can't do that. But, you know, we all have our different methods. The, plot, the, the characters should alter the plot as they go along because they should have such life that they'll push it around their own way. You know, they shouldn't just be chess pieces. So sometimes, sometimes something will happen to surprise you. Yes. A character will just say, yeah. actually, I am going to Greenland or yes. something like that. And that's great. That means that they're starting to get a life of their own. Like your children rebelling, though not too much, because rebellious children who have been there. <laughs> um, yes, just a little bit further on. The microphone's just there. I was actually going to ask exactly the same question you just asked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Do we have another question? We've got two more. Yes, there's one just, just there. Did you see one, Debbie, as well? Um, hi. Um, you talked about waiting for your um, characters to thicken. Is that something you... How, how do you do that? How do you kind of get into that process? Do you spend some time with them to allow them to develop or do you just let them kind of go with the story? Well, what I do is to spend enough time with them so that I know they'll start telling me what they're going to do. And that may take months. And, w and the things that I do, which might be useful for those of you who are writing, is I spend days as them. So I might spend days being a middle-aged, bearded, boozy old actor <laughs> called Buffy, hero of this novel. And I just, you know, I go to the shops. I don't know. I'm just thinking about, I'm thinking what he would notice. And, and then I ask myself questions like, what would they do if they were stuck in a lift? Or what would they do if they saw somebody shoplifting? Or what would they do, what sort of shoes do they wear? Alex and I were just talking very emotionally about shoes earlier. <laughs> and, um, or were. what were they bullied at school? And if you answer, ask these questions to yourself, thinking of the character, they'll, they, they'll start to gain weight, because you'll realize, of course, he was bullied. I'll give you an example. In Best Exotic, when I was writing it as, as this novel, These Foolish Things, I could not get one of the characters who I'd already started to write, but he didn't have any life to him. And he was a Parsi hotel owner. 
who became sort of Dev Patel in the film, but actually in the book he's a middle-aged Parsi man. I couldn't get him. And then I thought about him, I thought he's got, he's got quite a lot of hair products, he's got shiny shoes, he's very vain. And I know why his marriage was disastrous. He had a nice Parsi girl being lined up for him, but he bought some shoes that were just that little bit too small. We all know that, because he's a bit vain. Nice shiny shoes. And he got terrible corns, so he went to a shropodist. And the shropodist was this Hindu, rather pushy Hindu woman. And he fell in love with her. And he ditched his Parsi bride-to-be and fell in love with the Hindu woman and married her. And they've had a terrible marriage. She's a terrible bully. And that's his marriage, and that's the man who's running the hotel. I just got it by thinking he's got a bit of gel on his hair and shiny shoes, and I suddenly got him. But asking those questions really helps so that you start to put your characters in different situations to think, well, like, another thing, very quickly, is pin up photographs from newspapers, tear out pictures of either actors, Michael Gambon always works for me, because he can be anything. He's, he can be funny, he can be sexy, he can be you know, all sorts of wonderful actors. Uh, pin them up. And their faces will help. Or some, an unknown person from a newspaper, you're writing about a middle-aged woman, tear out a photo, pin her up. And that helps focus you. And that can help you get that character. Whether it looks like her or not, it doesn't matter. I and think it's a I'm, good trick. I'm taking away from this that we should always start with the shoes, though, and build up. Always start that, with that the shoes. Kind of really Alex helps. and I do. <laughs> in life, in books, <laughs> in, life in everything. And in books. Deb, I'm so sorry to say we've run out of time. You're going to be going over there to sign books. Thank you for giving us an insight into all sorts of things and your milkman. <laughs> Thank you very much to <laughs> Debbie Mogat. Thank you.